murders of four female American murder victims. Two were discovered in 1985 and two were discovered in 2000 at Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. All four of the victims were either partially or completely skeletonized and they were believed to have died between 1977 and 1981, at least four years to seven years before they were found. This recap is a compilation of abcnews.com, the Boston Globe, Bearbrook Podcast by the New Hampshire Public Radio and Wikipedia. On November 10, 1985, a hunter found a metal 55-gallon drum near the site of a burned-down store at Bearbrook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. Inside were the bodies of an adult female and a young girl wrapped in plastic. Autopsies determined both had died of blunt force trauma. The remains were of a woman aged 23 to 33 and a girl child aged 8 to 10. On May 9, 2000, the remains of two young girls were found near the first discovery site. Some boys were playing hide and seek in the woods that day and they found the barrel and used all their combined strength to topple it over and get it open. The bodies were also in a metal 55 gallon drum and police believe that all four murders occurred at roughly the same time. It has not been completely explained how the second barrel was missed during the investigation in 1985. According to investigators, the reason that it took so long for the second drum to be recovered is that it was located outside the borders of the initial crime scene. The cause of death for these children was also blunt forced trauma. With the remains being so decomposed, DNA being in the very early stages, and the second drum being found approximately 10 years after the murders, this case was a very difficult one to investigate and solve. In June 2013, new versions of the victims' facial reconstructions were created by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. These versions incorporated their dental information, showing how their teeth could have been affected, their appearance, and their faces. The reconstructions were also created in different skin tones as their skin colors and eye colors could not be determined. The mystery baffled investigators until 2017 when a new forensic technique known as genetic genealogy identified the likely killer, a career criminal and serial killer named Terry Peter Rasmussen. This was also the first case in which genetic genealogy was used to identify a crime suspect. This technique would also help catch the Golden State Killer. Teddy Rasmussen died in prison in 2010 while serving a sentence for another murder. However, the names of his victims still remained a mystery at the time. The identities were first discovered by two people outside law enforcement, amateur investigator Becky Heath and genetic genealogy Barbara Ray Venter. Heath and Ray Venter each discovered the identities independently within just a few weeks of each other. The New Hampshire State Police confirmed their discoveries with additional DNA testing and investigative work. Only three victims were identified originally. The, unidi and a, the unidentified fourth victim was not biologically related to the other victims, according to investigators. However, authorities had previously identified Rasmussen as her biological father. Becky Heath, who lived in Connecticut, says she spent countless hours scouring the internet for clues about the Bear Brook victims after first becoming aware of the case 10 years prior. Heath's research consisted largely of reading the internet forums where people searched for long lost relatives and other missing loved ones. Her hope was that a distant relative of the Bearbrook victims who had remained unidentified since they were first discovered in 1985 had been using such a form to look for them. In the fall of 2017, Heath first came across the name Sarah McWaters in an online post written by someone who said she was her half-sister. Sarah Waters' younger half-brother, who had never met her, created a post in 1999 on the Ancestry.com website in efforts to locate her. Sarah was born in Hawaiian Gardens in California when her father was in the Marines. In October 2018, a librarian web sleuth, Rebecca Heath, who was also looking for possible identities of the Bearbrook victims, found the post. 
She also found that Sarah's mother, Marlise Honeychurch, had an older daughter with her first husband, and that their ages matched those of the three related Bear Brook victims. Significantly, one of Sarah's relatives, who Heath contacted, mentioned Honeychurch, had married a man with the name of Rasmussen. This made Heath almost certain that they were the three related Bear Brook victims, and Heath shared her findings with Detective Peter Headley. <clears throat> able to match the birth dates of each member of the missing family to the estimated age ranges for the three related Bearbrook victims, the adult, the oldest child, and the youngest child. Heath shared her suspicions with a group of fellow amateur investigators, but the tip was not submitted to other law enforcement yet. According to Heath, her interest in the post about the three missing people was reignited in October 2018 when she began listening to Bearbrook a podcast produced by the New Hampshire Public Radio. Heath then contacted some of the family members who posted in the online thread. Through online messages, one of the family members told Heath they remembered Elizabeth Honeychurch had been with a man with the last name Rasmutin when they last saw her. Terry Peter Rasmutin had also been identified as the likely killer behind the Bearbrook murders by authorities in 2017. There was no way that this could be a coincidence. Heath finally submitted this tip to the police on October 12, 2018. At the same time, Becky Heath was turning to the internet forums for signs of the Bearbrook victims. Genetic genealogist Barbara Ray Venter was using the victims' DNA to find their identities. For months, Ray Venter had been attempting to use genetic genealogy to identify the Bearbrook victims. But unlike with her other uses of the technique, the DNA from the Bear Brook victims was highly degraded, a result of the bodies being exposed to the elements for many years. Forensic scientists have been able to retrieve mitochondrial DNA from the victim's hair, but to employ the type of genetic genealogy that Ray Venter hoped to use, she needed autosomal DNA, which is found inside the cell nucleus. Until recently at that time, it was thought that retrieving autosomal DNA from hair samples that do not still have a living root attached was impossible. Cell nuclei, along with autosomal DNA they carry, break down as cells become part of the hair strand. A forensic lab in California had been pioneering a new method that painstakingly reassembled the broken bits of autosomal DNA that can be found in rootless hair. After months and months of failed attempts and fine tuning, this technique was finally able to give Ray Venter a DNA sample that could be used in genetic genealogy. The adult, identified as Elizabeth Honeychurch, was determined to be white with possible Native American ancestry. Her age at the time of death was estimated to be between 23 to 33. She had curly or wavy brown hair 
and was between five foot two and five foot seven. Her teeth showed significant dental work, including multiple fillings and three extractions. The three girls were thought to have some Native American heritage too. They had light or European American complexions. The girl found with the adult female in 1985, identified as Elizabeth Vaughn, was between five and 11 years old. She had symptoms of pneumonia, a crooked front tooth, and a gap between her front teeth. She had two earrings in each ear and was between four foot three and four foot six inches tall. Her hair was also wavy and light brown and she had no dental fillings. The middle child who has still not been identified also had a gap between her front teeth and died at an age between two and four. She had brown hair and was about three foot eight inches tall. She had an overbite, which was probably noticeable and she also may have suffered from anemia. DNA eventually proved this child was fathered by Terry Rasmussen. February 2020, it was announced that DNA analysis suggested the child was primarily white with slight Asian, African, and Native American heritage. The youngest girl, eventually identified as Sarah McWaters, was estimated to be between one and three years old, had long blonde or light brown hair, and was between two foot one inch and two foot six inches tall, and also had a gap between her front teeth. In 2014, police announced that DNA profiling had revealed through mitochondrial DNA that the woman, the oldest, and the youngest girls were maternally related. This means that the woman could have been the girl's mother, aunt, or older sister. And finally, in 2015, the woman was confirmed as being the actual mother of the two girls. Other forensic information showed that the woman and children lived together in the northeastern United States between two weeks and three months before their deaths. Investigators have concluded the woman and two of the children lived in the area where their bodies were found. In 2019, however, it was found that the non-related child most likely originated from Arizona, Texas, California, or Oregon. Although additional locations cannot be excluded, this is the child that was proven by DNA to have been the daughter of the very transient Terry Rasmussen. On July 6, 2019, New Hampshire investigators held a press conference regarding the case and revealed the identities of the three victims. Elizabeth Honey Church was the mother of Marie Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah Lynn McWaters, all of whom went missing from La Puente, California around Thanksgiving 1978, while Elizabeth was dating Rasmussen. Elizabeth Honey Church had had an argument with her mother and left the residence, never contacting her relatives again. It is believed that all four victims were murdered before 1981 as Rasmussen was known to have left the New Hampshire area after this time in 1981, apparently leaving his victims behind. 
Elizabeth Honey Church and Elizabeth Vaughn's funerals were held in November 2019 in Allenstown, during which they were given a new headstone bearing their names. In attendance were members of Honey Church's family and Rem Rasmussen's daughter from his first marriage. Sarah was laid to rest in Connecticut, closer to her father's family. The search continued as of 2020 for the identity of the fourth victim, the daughter of Terry Resmutin, and an unknown mother. They have so far been unable to identify who the mother of the child was and whether or not she may still be alive. In February 2020, a new rendering of the fourth victim was released by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the New Hampshire State Police. Through continuing the use of DNA, genetic genealogy, in 2021, invest investigators revealed that the middle child's mother and relatives had relatives in Pearl River County, Mississippi. The following year, they de determined that she was most likely a descendant of Thomas Dead Horse Mitchell, a man who was born in 1836 and would be the fifth or sixth great grandfather of the child. Rasmutin's daughter, Andrea Steers, has said that she believes she had met the identified Jane Doe child when she was very young and that she was a cute child. She also believes that her sister, Jane Doe, was half Asian. Peter Rasmussen was an American convicted murderer and suspected serial killer who, convic who was convicted of one murder and linked to at least five more. Due to his use of many aliases, most notably Bob Evans and Larry Venner, Rasmussen is known as the chameleon killer. We may never know how many women he actually killed. Thank you for listening to another episode of Canvas and Crime. We will be back next week. If there is a story you would like to look into and recap, drop it in the comments. I avoid over sensationalized serial killers and the overly popular stories, but feel free to offer suggestions and maybe I can follow up. Thank you.